Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Have we got a treat for you. Perhaps the most remarkable tool chest ever made was called the Studley Tool Chest, made by a piano maker who lived right here in the Boston area. Now for years it hung in the Smithsonian, but now it's in a private collection out in Wisconsin, and it's very difficult to get a peek at. But we did. We'll take you in there next and show you this beautiful tool chest, and then we'll come back here and build our own version. That's next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. These wonderful music machines are part of a private collection in the Midwest. Now the location, I could suppose I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Come on, there's a lot more. Now if your piano skills are as bad as mine, you need one of these, a phonoless violina, made in Germany and for many years it resided in Malmo, Sweden. It's both a piano and a violin player. Tino Rossi. Well, I'm told that if I want to listen to all the musical instruments here, I have to take about six hours. So we better get to what we came here to see, which is what's been called probably the finest example of a tool chest. It was built by a piano maker from Boston by the name of Henry Studley. And he worked for the Pool Piano Company for 30 years between 1890 and 1920 when he put this together. Now the outside is Honduran mahogany with some ebony panels. Inside, an incredible collection of nearly 300 tools. And I'm told that this case is so heavy that it takes three strong men to lift it up onto the wall. I mean, look at the beauty of this cabinet and these tools. And it's very clever. Up here we have some hammers, but to get to the other tools you simply flip it up, a little vise, some needle nose pliers, some small squares, in its own little gothic cubby here, a number one Stanley plane, just one of several beautifully maintained tools. Now up in here, we lift up this area. We can see, I see a spoke shave way up there, and most of these tools I really don't recognize because they're specific to the piano making business. The woodwork, you see a lot of ebony, these little inlays are mother of pearl. These yellowish pieces are actually ivory. And look at these little drawers. Very well organized. They even have slides to move the trays back and forth. More drawers on this side. A couple back saws. A full collection of chisels. And I'm told that Mr. Studley actually turned these himself out of rosewood. A nice bit brace with some brass. In this section up here, you see marking tools. The whole area flips up. The drill bits slide to the side or hinge out. And behind it, a whole collection of auger bits. Just incredibly clever how he organized all these tools so that they were easily accessible. When I look at the level of craftsmanship in this chest and look at the quality and care taken with the tools, one can only imagine the kind of piano that Mr. Studley was able to build. Play it again, Tino. Well, that was quite a visit. And I must say, I'm still blown away by the quality of craftsmanship in that Studley tool chest. Now, he built that chest over his entire career. So be a little forgiving when you see ours. We only had a few days. He had a lifetime. But the concept is great. Get the tools up off the floor, organized, and not have them banging against each other. So here's our tool chest, located in this corner of the shop, which is easy to get to. I set the height so that I can easily reach everything. And I did take some inspiration from Studley, and that was to use a variety of species of wood. I always have semi-valuable pieces hanging around the shop, 
And being a Yankee, you don't throw anything out, and you know someday you'll find a use for them. So I have a mahogany frame for the door, a mahogany panel, and this nice black walnut for a molding. There are two door panels that hang on some heavy-duty piano hinges, and when you open it up, you've got three feet of height and six feet of length to store the tools. Everything is organized by category. Here are the gripping tools. Then I have measuring and marking tools in this area. Here I have saws, and then striking tools, shaping tools, and of course you always have some planes. On this panel, I have carving tools, screwdrivers, and chisels. I also incorporated a few small storage drawers for miscellaneous items. So if you'd like to build your own version of the wall-mounted tool chest, a measure drawing will be available, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. I want to get started today building the main case. Before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rules than to wear safety glasses. Here I've been cutting some of the parts for our tool chest. The case and the door boxes are made out of three-quarter inch thick mahogany veneer plywood. When I have to cut several pieces the same length, I like to use this miter gauge with an adjustable stop. First I slide the piece in, square up an end, then I flip it around, drop the stop, and cut it to length. That way every piece is exactly the same. You'd never know it looking at this piece that a lot of it's plywood. The frame for the door is covered by solid material on the front and a thin strip on the back. Now those frame pieces are joined together at the corners with a rabbit joint cut in the vertical pieces so that the horizontal piece just fits into it. That rabbit is made here at the table saw by setting up a stacked dado and a sacrificial strip. And I guide the piece through with my miter gauge. Let's take another look at our prototype. The next step is to make a dado in each side panel to receive this shelf. After I do that, I'll put a series of dados in the shelf and the bottom to receive the partitions between the drawers. I've set up the dado and taken a scrap of three-quarter inch plywood and run it through to make a test cut, and that fits the thickness of my plywood exactly. Now, the thickness of plywood is not as advertised. It frequently runs about a 30-second thinner. Fortunately, this dado set comes with a chipper that's a 30-second thinner, so it's easy to match the plywood. I've just taken the four sides of the main cabinet in the center and run a dado in each piece, and that's going to receive this 3 quarter inch plywood back. Now you may think that's overkill, but there's a lot of weight here that's going to be hanging on this plywood, and I want a solid backing to attach all the fixtures to hold the tools. I've just machined a rabbit in the four pieces of the door box, and that's necessary to receive a panel. It's a mahogany face, premium on one side, secondary on the other side, with an MDF core. That will get glued and nailed to the door, the good side will face in, and that'll give it a lot of strength and give me a place to attach my fixtures. Well, now I'm ready for a little assembly. Glue in every dado, even for the back, I want this to be as solid as possible. And since it's all made out of plywood, I don't have to worry about expansion and contraction issues. I may need a couple clamps as I go along to pull it together, but the glue and brads will hold it. Well, this may seem like overkill, all these dados and rabbits and glue and nails, but this piece is going to be heavy. We don't want it to go anywhere. Well, here's the first door box. I've nailed the corners together, applied a bead of glue in that rabbit, and now I can set the panel and fasten that with some brads. For the last several minutes, I've been cutting and fitting these pieces of solid mahogany, which are going to cover the edges of the plywood that actually show. 
I'm not going to bother with this edge or this edge of the door box because that's going to be covered with the piano hinge. And I'm not going to bother with this because no one's ever going to see it. Forgive me, Mr. Studley. To attach the strips, a little bit of glue and a few brads. When I ripped my strips, they were slightly wider than the thickness of the plywood. Now I'm using my random orbit sander to bring it nice and flush. And I've learned the hard way, be patient, don't push it. These veneers are so thin, if I do too much sanding, I'll blow right through it. Let's take another look at the prototype. You'll note that these hinges wrap around the edge of the plywood. A standard piano hinge would just have these two leaves, and these screws would be going in to the edge of the plywood, and that wouldn't hold very well. But once you wrap the hinge around and have screws coming from both directions, that's not going to go anywhere. You pay a little extra for those, but I think it's worth it. Now, I bought them in four-foot lengths, and I have to cut them first, and I'm going to use my jigsaw with a metal cutting blade. Now, that cut leaves behind a very sharp edge, so I just take a standard file and knock that off. I have to do some further modification to the hinge before I can install it. I have to remove part of that wraparound leaf in the area of the drawer. And on the door side, I have to take this little piece out so it clears this part. I also do the same thing on the other end. Same tools, same techniques. With those cuts made, you can drop it in place and secure it with the screws. Now, I'll tell you what this hole is all about. It's for a little round magnet. I don't need a large magnet. I just want something that's going to keep that door closed. And I'll just tap it in with a piece of wood. That's all I need on that end. Down here on the other end, there's a little plate, and that gets secured with a screw. And that's all I need. Okay. And that's going to keep the doors closed. I've just drilled some holes in this plywood cleat, which is beveled at 45 degrees. And this is part of our hanging system for this cabinet. We first used this technique on some cabinets for our garage workshop, but this is something that a lot of kitchen installers also use. This cleat gets faced with the 45 going in towards the cabinet. I put a good bead of glue down there, and I secure it with some screws. Now, the corresponding piece also has a 45-degree bevel that angles in. This gets attached to the wall, either drilled into the studs or into solid wood, and you simply drop the cabinet onto this cleat. It's simple, it's strong, and it locks it in place. Well, that's all we'll do for today. Tomorrow, we'll finish it up. Good morning. Today, we're going to get started by making some doors. So let's take another look at the prototype. It's a flat panel door with an applied molding, and the door gets attached to the case with some screws, and then the screw heads are covered with these bunks. So over here on the bench, I have the various parts, the styles, the rails, and another piece of that 3 8 mahogany for the panel. Let me show you how I'm going to join them together. The rails and styles get a groove, the styles get a tenon on the end, and that's going to get glued together like that. Now the panel, I have to wrap at the back edge, to thin it down so that it fits into those grooves. And then we'll make some molding on our molding machine to trim it out. The setup is a quarter inch dado, a half inch high, and a featherboard to keep the stock tight against the fence as I run it through. All four frame pieces need a groove. Now the tenon on our piece is actually offset. It has to align with the groove. So the first setup, and I've just run a sample, is to do the shallow side. I've installed a sacrificial strip and widened the dado. Now I'm ready to run the pieces. I've raised the dado and now just run the other side of the tenon. And I want to check the fit on my actual styles. And that's a nice slip fit, not too loose. Now I'll run the final pieces through.
Now, while the dado is still in the saw, I just loaded a bit, ran a rabbit around all four edges of the panel to fit into that groove. Well, we're ready to put it together. So a little bit of glue in the groove on each end of the styles, and then I'll also spread some on the tenons. And now the panel, no glue there. All right, well, we'll let that cook in the clamps for a while and take another look at the prototype. The next thing I want to do is make this panel molding. I happen to have a set of knives from a previous project, and I had some scrap walnut hanging around the shop. Now, here's our molding machine, and we're very fortunate to have one of these. Antiques often have profiles which are not seen in standard catalogs, so we can make our own moldings. So when I have a profile that I want made, which would be the shape of the molding, I fax that up to the manufacturer of the machine. He grinds these knives and then sends them back to me in about 24 hours. I simply have to bolt them into the machine. Now, the second part of it is that I need a way to guide the material under that knife. So I like to make a little jig with some side pieces into which my blank stock fits, and that makes sure it doesn't wander as it passes under the knife. Now, when it comes to fitting the moldings for the panel door, I like to use this miter gauge, which is very accurate. And I like to take my four pieces and miter one end at 45 degrees. Then I take the piece bring it over to the door, butt it up against the side, don't tip it down, just bring it up to the edge like that, and mark the length on the other end. Now when I bring it back to the saw, the first thing I have to do is swing the gauge to 45 degrees on the other side of zero, lock it in place, and you'll note that my pencil mark is actually on the back side of the saw, I can't see where to start. So what I like to do is cut it a little bit long and then nibble back to my mark. With all the pieces fitted, I just set them in place, dry, no glue, and I'll secure them with some pin nails. Now I've organized the completed doors on the case. The height of the door is about an eighth of an inch bigger than the case, so I let it hang down a sixteenth of an inch. On the edge here, I have to keep it flush on the hinge side, otherwise the door won't be able to open all the way. Nice and even along the bottom. I pre-drilled and countersunk for the screws, but now I'm going to use a drill bit to do a pilot hole in the plywood. So I don't want that plywood to split as I drive the screws. Now for the plugs, a scrap of our walnut and my 3 8 inch plug cutter. Right, now just a little dab of glue around the plug. Set it in there and tap it down. We'll let those set until the glue dries. Now we'll just take our Japanese flush cut saw, which cuts on the pull, cut them flush and then sand them even. Here I've flipped the cabinet upside down and I'm making a recess here that'll be a pull in order to open the door. I didn't want any hardware on the face. I'm simply using a guide fence and a one inch round nose bit. Well, let's take another look at the prototype and start to work on our drawers. The fronts are tiger maple, the sides and the back are heart pine, and I joined them together with box joints. And you need a jig to make those. Here's the jig that I made up. It's a piece of plywood attached to my miter gauge. Now there's a stick. It's like a guide pin. Then there's a space, which is equal to the width of the dado blade, and then a cut all the way through, or a notch. And how I start to use it is I'll take a draw front, slide it up against the pin, make a pass, then the notch that's made by the saw, I drop that over the pin, make another pass, and continue all along the edge. It works every time. Now we do the same thing with the back. 
When it comes to the side pieces, I want to start by using this gauge stick, which is the same width as the pin. I put the stick against the pin, make the first cut, then remove the pin and proceed as before. Okay, let's see how we did. Nice slip fit. Now you'll notice that these pins are just a touch higher than they need to be. I'll sand those smooth after the assembly. The bottom of the drawer is a piece of quarter inch plywood and I need a groove for that. On the front and the back, that groove is going to run right along where this finger joint cutout is. So I simply can run the piece through this straight cutting bit. However, on the sides, that slot is going to fall right on these fingers. If I were to run it through, I would have a hole. So I have to drop it on, run it through, and remove it before I go through the end. All right, a thin coat of glue on both sides of the joint, and then I got to decide to slip all these pieces together. It may take a clamp to persuade them into the final position. Yeah, we'll squeeze this together and square it up and set it aside to dry for a little while. Now for the knobs on our drawers, I used some babinga. I've got a strip here that's about three quarters of an inch square. I've tipped my saw to five degrees and I'll bevel each edge. And a screw secures it. Now for the tools. Not everyone's tool collection is going to be exactly the same, but here's some suggestions on how you might hang them. I like to group the tools by category, first of all. It's easy to make wooden supports. I don't want metal against these tools. A simple wooden support for squares. I frequently use doll pins. Over here where there are saws, just a straight piece of wood with some thin cuts in it. Here, what I did is I actually took the shape of the cutout in the saw handle and made a little device to hang it. For the hammers, again, a flat piece supported with brackets and little cutouts. Over here, a sloped support for one of my large planes. And one thing that just about everyone is going to have to deal with will be screwdrivers and chisels. So I'll show you how I made this fixture. Now here I just took a piece of 7 8 inch thick wood and drilled a series of 7 8 holes about 2 inches on center and made these notches. Now what you take into consideration is the size of the chisel. The hole shouldn't be big enough that it can fall through and the notch has to be wide enough so you can easily get the chisel in and out. Now I'll just complete the notches. Now when it comes to locating this fixture, I take the longest chisel slip it into the fixture and make sure it's bottomed out. I want to make sure it just clears that bottom shelf and I secure it with some screws. Now this is when a double layer of 3 8 plywood comes in handy. I have plenty of meat for these screws to go into. For a finish on our hanging tool chest, I'm using a Danish oil. A few coats should do the job. It'll help protect the wood and it brings out the richness of our fine woods. You know, this has been a long overdue project here at the New Yankee Workshop. Finally, we have a place to store our fine woodworking tools. I hope this project will inspire you to build one for your own home workshop. So, until next time, I'm Norm Abram for the New Yankee Workshop. If you enjoyed this New Yankee project, please visit our website at newyankee.com for a complete online catalog of all the other projects you've seen Norm build here in the New Yankee Workshop.